Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. Today I'm going to be interviewing my longtime friend, Dr. Mark Plotkin. Uh, Dr. Plotkin was educated at Harvard, Yale, and Tufts University. And is re he is a renowned ethnobotanist who has studied indigenous plant use with elder traditional healers uh, in Central and South America. He's done this for the past 30 years. As an ethnobotanist, he is a scientist who studies how and why societies have come to use plants uh, for various purposes. Dr. Plotkin carried out the majority of his research with the Trio Indians in southern Suriname, which is a small country in northeastern South America. But he's also worked with shamans everywhere from uh, Mexico down to Brazil. Uh, Dr. Plotkin has served as research associate uh, in ethnobotanical conservation at the Botanical Museum at Harvard University. Uh, he has served as Director of Plant Conservation at the World Wildlife Fund, and he is now President of the Amazon Conservation Team. I want to emphasize the name Amazon Conservation Team because one of the main reasons we're putting this uh, program together today is that you can look at the Amazon Conservation Team, a wonderful non-for-profit organization that can use our support. He co-founded this organization with his with his fellow conservationist and wife, uh, Liliana Madrigal, in 1996. And now this organization has well over 15 years of success uh, in uh, dedicated to protecting the biological and cultural diversity of the Amazon. And we're going to find out why that's so, so important uh, in our interview today. In 1998, he played a leading role in the Academy Award-nominated IMAX film, Amazon. Uh, Time Magazine has hailed him as an environmental hero of the planet, and his work has been featured on a PBS uh, Nova documentary, in an Emmy-winning Fox TV documentary, on the uh, NBC Nightly News, 48 Hours, in Life Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, uh, Smithsonian Magazine, and even the New York Times, along with appearances multiple times on public radio. Dr. Plotkin's TED Talk, uh, which deals with protection of the Amazon's uh, uncontacted tribes, has had more than one million views, and we will certainly post a link uh, to his TED Talk uh, later in the program. So uh, let's just jump right in and say hello to Dr. Mark Plotkin. So how are you doing, Mark Plotkin? Fine. It's great to be here. Uh, I was just reviewing your recent TED Talk. Again, i uh, watched it several times, and um, you know, I think for our viewers, We've known each other for a long, long time, and we're doing work that is so very, very different indeed. Uh, but when you think about it, um, it's very, very similar. I mean, we're involved in looking at the, the biodiversity of gut bacteria, and that's really been a central theme for your work all these years, hasn't it been? Well, shamans talk about the interconnectedness of all things. In Western terms, you might refer to it as the butterfly effect. What happens in one place far off may affect you right here at home. And whether you're looking at the uh, microbiome of the human gut or the diversity of the rainforest, like you said, David, there's obvious connections. So why should we care about biodiversity in the Amazon? Well, you're a physician. I'm an ethnobotanist. That is a scientist who works with indigenous peoples to document the uses of uh, local plants. First and foremost, as an ethnobotanist, I think it's because of the medical secrets they hold. I mean, there's no doubt that Western medicine is the most successful and sophisticated system of healing ever devised, but as you know, it's full of holes. It's full of holes in our inability to cure pancreatic cancer. It's full of holes in the fact that we do things or eat things that are bad for us. And there's lessons to be learned from these people who some people uh, in our own culture might dismiss as uh, primitive. You, you tell a very interesting story, and I think it's very compelling about your foot injury and how you had uh, mainstream treatments with uh, anti-inflammatories and cortisone and you name it. Uh, but then uh, one of your uh, colleagues down in the jungle came after you with a machete or present, took your machete, <laughs> I think it was. Tell us about that. Well, I'd injured my foot and I was in the village looking for plants and he noticed that I was limping and he said, huh, uh, take off your shoe and uh, give me your machete. And I did as I was told, and I measured this. He went to a palm tree three meters away, scraped off a fern, and ferns, according to botanists, don't have any real interesting chemicals in them, uh, threw it in the fire, applied it to my foot, threw it in a pot, and had me drink it. 
and the pain cleared up immediately, uh, although it did come back seven months later, at which point I went back to the jungle. I went back to the shaman. Uh, he treated me the same way, and that was uh, four years ago at this point, and I've been pain-free. So sometimes you see these people can cure things that we cannot. Not always, of course. Um, you've been in the jungle, basically, in and out of the jungle for 30 years. And are we making progress in the right direction or are we losing ground? Well, it's a tough question to answer because we're burning the candle at both ends. There's more awareness of the importance of conservation than ever before. Witness the success of the meetings in Paris recently. But there's also an enormous amount of destruction. So there's no simple answer to this. It's not a yes or no thing. The answer is that there are good things happening, there's bad things happening, and the race is on to protect as much as possible. You know, uh, one of the interesting things you, you pointed out uh, in terms of the value of the diversity uh, in the jungle is how, you know, we are leveraging that information to develop pharmaceuticals. And, you know, what, you, you talked about ACE inhibitors and the various things. Uh, in fact, most I, I, I would expect of uh, our mainstream pharmaceuticals have some form of natural derivation. <clears throat> is there ongoing efforts to really look at that even these days? Well, not enough. And the reason is that the pharmaceutical companies were pretty abusive in the old days and not a nickel from ACE inhibitors, which originated in the forests of Brazil, uh, not a nickel from beta blockers, which originated in the hallucinogenic mushrooms in Mexico, went back to the Indians, went back to the countries. Mm. So that's no longer an acceptable way of doing business. That being said, uh, there are models now to do it better. But the pharmaceutical companies, by and large, have turned their back on natural products for a variety of reasons, which I think is a, not only a terrible mistake, but a very stupid one. And no one is a greater believer in the power of uh, high-tech chemistry to do and find and manipulate stuff, but to write off Mother Nature, who's been doing high-tech chemistry for three billion years, is, is simply foolish. What is a guy like you, how does a guy like you end up in the jungle? Where, how did that all come about? Well, I had dropped out of college at the age of 19 and enrolled in a class in the botany and chemistry of hallucinogenic plants, this being the end of the 60s, it had a certain appeal. And I just went off to the jungle in search of romance and adventure, and I found it. And I've just turned 60, but I'm still at it. I have the most interesting job in the world, and there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. The, the problem is the destruction of the forest, the destruction of these cultures. Uh, I'm, I'm watching this stuff literally go up in smoke before my eyes, and it's my job and the job of all ethnobotanists and caring physicians and caring people to put a stop to this, put a stop to it for ethical reasons, put a stop to it for climatological reasons, because the carbon that goes up in the atmosphere is driving climate change, put a stop to it for medical reasons, because there are wonder drugs there, and they are disappearing. And I will say this, that as an ethnobotanist, I was taught to focus on plants and taught to focus on shamans. But after decades of work, it became obvious to me that they're not just using plants. They're also using insects. Uh, they're also using frogs. And it only was after decades of research that they revealed these secrets to me. So once again, it's obvious that they know way more than we even thought they knew. Uh, but again, it's disappearing and it's our job to protect it and put it to use in an eth ethical way where everybody benefits, not just us. Well, how are we preserving that information aside from your work? I mean, w w what's happening to keep that information uh, available? Well, David, I've been criticized because I don't publish this information. And, and my response is, well, it's not my information. It's a secret. It's trade secrets. So what I've been doing at the Amazon Conservation Team, the organization that I run, is training these people to write it down in their own language, training these people to make films in their own language. First and foremost, it should be protected by them because as they make the transition from pre-literate cultures to literate cultures, they can write it down themselves. And I have to say it, even though it pains me somewhat, this is a really good and powerful thing that missionaries have done, is create written languages from these tribal languages and teach them how to read and write. Of course, they do it so they read and write the Bible. Uh, which is useful, but of limited utility when you're fighting off gold miners, limited utility when your forest is disappearing. So the Bible has its place in terms of teaching the golden rule, but it doesn't have all the answers, uh, which unfortunately some missionaries still tell them is the case. You, you know, to me, you're a bit of an Indiana Jones, and so I, I really enjoy hearing about your adventures. Let me get back <laughs> to this kind of comparison between 
the importance of the biodiversity, which obviously we are losing uh, in leaps and bounds in the Amazon and globally um, at a rate estimated between 100 to 1,000 times more uh, quickly than in the past. But I, I've talked uh, and written about the importance of biodiversity in terms of the, the gut organisms to give us uh, flexibility and adaptability. Right. So we're losing that uh, in the Amazon, and that's having global impacts. Absolutely true. Uh, first of all, I want to go back to Indiana Jones. Remember that Indiana Jones was a tomb robber. <laughs> so the analogy is not completely a, a flattering one. But as, as a person who got people interested in tropical fieldwork, there's no better archetype. And I'm proud to say that Harrison Ford is one of our financial supporters. Uh, secondly, in terms of what we can learn from these people, what we need to know about these people, the, the value of these people, uh, you and I were talking earlier about the Hadza, which are the last hunter-gatherer tribe in Africa. A fabulous documentary was just made about them by my friend Bill Benenson, which I highly recommend. And one of the unforeseen things that's come out of research on these primitive people is that they have this fabulous gut biome, much more diverse than ours. And the takeaway lesson is that originally we, having evolved on the savannas of East Africa, probably had a much more diverse gut biome. And as you've said powerfully in your writings, that the, 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 the uh, bad thing about the modern diet is it screwed up who we are, uh, that our modern diet may be destroying this. And only by going back to the Hadza, uh, going back to the uncontacted or the recently contacted people in the Amazon, there's lots to learn. So it ain't just about uh, you know, new medicinal plants for cancer. It ain't just about shamanic diagnostics, which is a whole other interesting field in and of itself. It's just, you know, I was asked once, what's it like working with shamans? And I said, you know, it's like, it's like that Chinese box puzzle where you open up a box and there's another box inside and you open up another box and there's a box inside. Just to get to the smallest box possible with the ultimate answer to your, your question, there's another box inside. So this is just one more manifestation of why, A, it's important to understand, protect these people, and B, why the world is a much more interesting and diverse place than we ever dreamed possible, whether it's the number of plants in the rainforest, the number of microorganisms in the soil, or the microbiome in indigenous peoples around the world. You brought up a couple of points, I think, that are really interesting. I think your analogy with the Chinese box uh, story was really brought to my mind kind of the, the fractal imagery of uh, just repeating patterns. And, you know, here I am a physician having a conversation with an ethnobotanist, and we're basically talking about exactly the same thing, that the balances, the checks and balances and the, and the homeostatic mechanisms that keep us alive are the same that are keeping the planet alive and require the diversity that we are losing. And, you know, interestingly enough, when we look at Pre preserved uh, evidence of the microbiome that by doing genetic analysis of either fossilized fecal material called coprolites or even the dental calculus, we realize that the diversity and array of bacteria 8,000 years ago was actually, uh, is actually very similar to what we're seeing in indigenous populations who are alive today. And the only people who are outside of the loop are really those of us living in a very cosmopolitan environment. So this isn't something genetically determined. It's something that we acquire and then maintain. And we're just beginning to understand how we can rebuild that. You know, my hope is that um, there will be recoverability in the work that you're doing. And I think, you know, basically it means getting out of the way. Well, when I became an ethnobotanist in the 70s, I had people say to me, actually, and I quote, who gives a shit about the rainforest? We need to worry about zero population growth. Now I have people say to me, well, who cares about the Amazon? We have to worry about climate change. Well, it's all the same thing, okay? Whether you're talking microbiomes in Naples, Florida, or whether you're talking uh, uh, hunter-gatherers in East Africa, it's all the same thing. I did a, a piece for the Skoll Foundation that's on YouTube where they said, talk about nuclear proliferation, talk about overpopulation, talk about new antibiotics and drug-resistant bacteria, and related to shamans in the rainforest, it's all interconnected. And that's why when I hear the stuff that you're doing or I, I read your books, uh, it's the same thing. It all connects, and, and, and a lot of people just don't get that. Very frustrating. Well, we live in a very reductionist society, especially as it relates to health and medicine, that 
you know, we have the cardiologists and the neurologists and gastroenterologists, and no one wants to communicate, recognizing that we are all intertwined. It reminds me of the, of the, of the chief Seattle quote that man uh, is merely a, a, a strand of, of the web of life, basically. And uh, I think this interconnectedness is something that we just don't want to appreciate, uh, even from a, a geopolitical standpoint, that we are all interconnected and we, we darn well better get that message. And I think really soon because, you know, I think certainly you're seeing the clock is ticking. And, and in my world, the manifestations are, you know, this failure of immune uh, regulation and the autoimmune conditions, uh, the, the uh, inflammatory disorders and the uh, issues that relate to overactivity of the immune system. I think, you know, basically the Amazon is losing its adaptability, its resiliency, and we're feeling global impacts from that. You mentioned the butterfly analysis. That's so important. Uh, you brought along uh, some images today. Can we take a look at those? I did, sure. Great. The, fir the first picture is my friend and mentor, Amashina. He's the paramount shaman of the Trio tribe in the Northeast Amazon. Uh, we've been working together for 33 years, and he is the guy who treated my foot. So uh, people who want more information about my work and particularly focusing on isolated tribes, uh, this is the guy who started it all in terms of uh, treating my foot and uh, with a very successful result. Now, Mark, on the bottom of that image, it that's, uh, shows a web address, amazonteam.org. That's right. how we find you, right? Yeah, that's uh, the Amazon conservation team. And there's lots of stories and elaboration on many of the things that I'm throwing out now in terms of ethnographic mapping, where we've trained over 30 tribes to map, manage, and improve protection of 70 million acres of ancestral rainforest, our shaman's apprentice work. The next picture uh, with my wife and partner Liliana shows me talking to my head cartographer, Wuta, again, a guy I've been working for 30 years. So here's a guy who was born in the Stone Age, but uh, can use the GPS far better than I can, and has not only taught his tribe how to map, but has done it for tribes in Suriname and Brazil, as personally responsible for the mapping of 20 million acres of rainforest. The tribe after, the picture after that is one of my favorites. It's taken by Bruce Hoffman, a colleague of mine living in the Northeast Amazon. I'm very jealous of that. And this is the trio Indians building a new roundhouse. This is about three stories off the ground. There isn't a single nail there. They're using uh, forest fibers to tie together uh, forest sticks, forest uh, saplings, to make the superstructure on which will be woven palm leaves. It almost looks like a spider web. It, well, it is. It's a spider web of life in the forest. Next picture is a black and white image of me and my very good friend Kamanya taken in 1984. This is two years after we started working together. And I like this picture very much because it captures a very, uh, just a, 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 a picture of us working together and bonding. And I contrast that with the next picture, which is the same picture, same guys, uh, same pose 30 years later. And as uh, somebody pointed out when I posted this on Facebook, well, the, the, the notebook you're holding in this image is much bigger than the notebook you were holding in the first image. And I said, well, as the brain grows smaller, the notebook has to grow bigger. And the font size gets bigger. <laughs> <laughs> that too. The next picture is a lot of fun because after I gave my TED talk last year in Rio, I headed straight for the Northeast Amazon and gave my TED talk uh, in the village of Kwamalasamutu, which is where the talk started. It's the story of my foot and the shaman. And I'm surrounded by shamans and apprentices. Uh, the one to my right, to the viewer's left, is Kamanya, the guy in the previous picture. And when I was going through that, I showed the picture of the magic frog. And he said, oh, we have that frog here. And I said, well, I've never seen it. And he said, well, that's because it lives in the canopy. And I said, how do you know this frog? He said, well, we use it for healing. And I said, well, I've been here for 30 years, and you never told me you used this for medicine. And he said, well, you've been here for 30 years, and you never asked me if we used it for medicine. So that shows the value of persistence and building up a relationship over time. And then the last image is me with my first mentor there, who was the Jaguar Shaman of the Trio Tribe. When I went there, everybody was in a red breechcloth. But this is uh, many years later, a few years before he died. And I think you can see the expression on our face, the, the bonding and the relationship between us. And you just don't see this with a lot of Western researchers. And again, I, I posit that it's the sheer doggedness and determination and the long-term relationships, which gets people open up and 
teach you things that they wouldn't teach you if you were just there for your thesis for nine months. Well, it brings up an interesting idea, a question on my part, and that is, how did, how did you gain their acceptance and trust early on? Well, you know, I just turned 60 and I grew up on Tarzan films. And my idea was you get to the village and you say, take me to your leader. And then you become their blood brothers and dance around the fire. Well, that's the Hollywood version. And let's face it, friendships don't happen in one meeting. Uh, it takes time. So it's not like you get there and they accept you as their brother and friend. It takes time. And I've been working with these people over 30 years, as you said in the introduction, and they're still showing me new plants and new frogs, which also means that they're still not showing me stuff. So this idea that it's one-stop shopping uh, is very reductionist, like you referred to earlier. And it just takes more time than most Americans who always want to cut to the chase. Uh, we're the original GST people get stuff done. Uh, they don't want to sit around and drink hallucinogenic potions and take hallucinogenic snuff and dance around the fire for three days. Uh, but you know what? That's part of the job. Is there any um, utilization uh, that, that you have uh, allowed or uh, encouraged to happen here in America in terms of uh, applying the knowledge that you've brought or that, that these individuals could bring? In other words, is there a way of transplanting that activity to other places? <laughs> That's a longer answer and a longer interview. The obvious one is plants, but the process is complicated and it has to be done ethically, which is not something that's really been done much of in the past. So that's not uh, uh, going to happen in time in the short term. Another one which I've been championing for some time is shamanic diagnostics. I think the shamans can sometimes teach you ways to analyze patients that we don't do using CAT scans and MRIs and x-rays. You know, if you read Lori Garrett's uh, wonderful book, The Coming Plague, she talks about the fact that her great uncle, I think it was, when it's in Ellis Island, and he could, you know, look people in the eye or listen to them cough and diagnose whether they should be admitted or not. That, that's not taught much in medical school, I'm willing to bet, these days. It's a little bit like that first Star Wars film uh, where he turns them to turn off the computer and trust the force. You know, doctors need to re-inculcate that knowledge that they may have that they don't use because you rely on technology. Technology should be an aid, not a crutch, you know, speaking as a non-physician. Well, you know, there, there does seem to be a resurgence, though, in interest in things uh, like Ayurvedic, a pulse diagnosis. And, uh, you know, it's the reason I ask you that question is, um, I, you know, I guess if it could be monetized, that would probably be a big impetus to bring that kind of knowledge uh, For sure. Which, you know, is, is the way of the world. Uh, I want to just let our viewers know that after uh, this interview, again, I'm going to give you information about Dr. Plotkin's work, where you can go on YouTube and look at his uh, TED Talk, and also how we can be supportive of the Amazon conservation team. So when do you go back to the jungle? Uh, I'm applying for permits in February to go to the Northwest Amazon. There's a sacred mountain my mentor climbed in 1943, and it took me four years to find it. I was working for old photos. He passed on in 2001. Uh, Google Earth, I went to headquarters. Royal Geographic Society in London, I went into the basement uh, library. Uh, library of Congress, uh, it's a long and complicated story, but I found the mountain. Nobody's wow. been there since 1943 when he climbed it. And I, I've got to get back up that mountain. That in and of itself is a, is a great story. Uh, um, really uh, very uh, empowering to, to think about how that must have been back in the in 1940s to, to make a trip like that. But then again, uh, I guess the, the rubber tree kind of spurred the real interest in that whole area, didn't it? Well, it ties in because... He was there in 1941, supposed to be there for six months investigating the arrow poisons, which were then becoming important in Western medicine. The war broke out, and they said, we need rubber. Don't go to the U.S. and enlist. Get your ass back to the jungle and find rubber. And he found this sacred area uh, where the Indians had already gone extinct and found several varieties of drug-resistant rubber. But nobody went back because it was so remote. They tried to set up research station in the 90s, and they were chased out by the Gadilla. Uh, so it's been off limits, but with the diminution of the civil strife in Colombia, uh, it, it's opening back up. Great. Well, let me again thank you uh, for your time and more so uh, for the incredible contribution that you're making uh, to the planet. Um, we've really got to get our arms around this and, and take a step back and recognize that each and every one of us, uh, we're not the center of the universe. We're 
interconnected in ways that we're just beginning to understand. So Mark, uh, kudos to you. Thanks for all the work that you're doing. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Well, thanks, David. You know, your work on grains and my work in the jungle, like I said, it's all connected. So uh, let's uh, both hope for a better future for us, our families, and for all of us. Okay. Thanks, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thanks again. Well, I certainly learned a lot from Dr. Plotkin today, and it reinforces uh, our need to look at uh, all these influences in terms of planetary health uh, from the perspective uh, of how it affects our health, but also certainly uh, how events in the Amazon uh, are truly global in terms of their impact. So uh, again, uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to present Dr. Plotkin's work uh, is because it is so impactful and I'm going to provide you a link uh, to the Amazon Conservation Team. Again, this is a non-for-profit organization that can absolutely use our financial support. Uh, he's doing fantastic work and I am sure uh, grateful uh, that he had the opportunity to, to be with us today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.